So that's where the nursing advocacy comes in. That's where nursing advocacy comes in. And, and you have to say to the administrators, I mean, doctors are usually in agreement, like, okay, this person could not vote, could not survive out there on their own without coming back to the emergency room. It's a, it's our, it's an equivalent safety net to prison. I mean, it's it's our only two safety nets we have in America are prison and, and, host, and the emergency room. Um, but anyway, so at, from a nursing perspective and from a, yeah, a hospital perspective, they would say, okay, no, if we deem them that they can't, either don't have capacity or don't have the ability to get the resources that they need, they're gonna stay in the hospital. But at whose cost? You know, at, at what cost? And again, it's about $5,000 a day uh, out of pocket to pay for the hospital, whatever basic services they provide. Which, is, you know, the hospital, knows that this patient's not going to pay that, you know, no matter how many debt collectors, you know, 10 years down the road. So anyway, so the hospital has an interest in getting the hem then out of there. Kylie, what in the hell is going on with people who it, for whatever reason or another, are incapable of sort of taking ownership of their own legal, like they lose their mental capacity, say, while they're, and they don't have anything set up to deal with that. It kind of creates sort of this weird gray zone or something. Which I, sorry to use terms like gray zone, because fuck those guys at the gray zone. Tanky sellouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, this, um, yeah, this, <laughs> this issue only comes up, I mean, it's, it's topical because I've had a few patients recently that have been in this situation, um, and I've had them taking care of patients like this over my career, but patients who are stuck in the hospital because they don't have a safe discharge plan. Um, and I'm grateful that we have the opportunity, that they have that ability to be in the hospital for food and shelter and care, uh, but it's going to drive up healthcare costs for everybody uh, if we don't address this problem, right? Or it already has. Um, <clears throat> and so if it's not addressed, um, other people can get blamed for higher costs of healthcare. Um, but anyway, it's uh, patients who come into the hospital who definitely were admitted for a very critical issue, a uh, medical issue, um, but that eventually gets resolved and it's time to discharge and they have nowhere to go or they are someone who can't walk without not only a walker, but somebody nearby because they will fall. Um, and they don't have those resources available or they don't have family willing or able to take care of them. And, and in our society, it defaults to family um, to be the primary caretakers in um, old age or when there's a handicap or when there's a disability that's kind of like built into our society. Uh, as an expectation, not really resource wise, but an expectation that your next of kin will take care of you um, when you need it. Uh, but that should not be an assumption <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but again, because of either people's willingness or their lack, their own lack of resources. Anyway, so we have these people in the hospital who are residents of the hospital because we can't find placement for them. Um, there are facilities available that provide short term rehab. And um, they are can be covered by health insurance. Uh, and so in order to get into a facility like that, you usually need to prove that you have health insurance and that your health insurance is going to cover it. They want to get paid. Uh, but also, uh, in addition to that, they want to know what your plan is after you get there and you get rehabilitated. Where are you going to go? So we've run into a problems where these short-term rehab facilities won't even take patients that need to go there because they don't have somewhere to go afterwards because they know they're going to get stuck with the patient. <laughs> right. Um, and so here we are. Mm -hmm. yeah, let me, let, let's back up just a little bit. So even before they get to that point, let's say they don't need, that's just not an option at all. The um, short term um, care facility. What is the hospital going to do there? There is no next of kin. There is no potential facility. What if they don't have insurance? Like what happens? Does the hospital just, you know, wheel them out to the front sidewalk? 
Yeah, it depends, it depends on the hospital. It depends on if they have an ethics committee. It depends on their budget that year. It depends on staffing. It depends how rude the patient is. It depends on their criminal record. I mean, unfortunately, I've seen these things um, dictate what happens to the patient. Um, so there are situations where people get wheeled out to the front door. I mean, you have nowhere to go, but if they've been deemed, they have the facilities to find food if they need it, to find shelter if they need it. And, and let's just be um, clear. Let's be really clear here. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're talking about in these situations, wheeling someone out to the sidewalk who doesn't have the ability to take care of themselves. Maybe they don't even know are aware that they exist on the planet at this point. And on top of that, they have underlying serious medical health issues. So I should say that... I mean, these, they just... I mean, I think that in a lot of these situations, they be, may be lucky if they have the mental capacity to find their way under the bridge to sleep by a rock. It's, so that's where the nursing wow. advocacy comes in. That's where nursing advocacy comes in. And, and you have to say to the administrators, I mean, doctors are usually in agreement, like, okay, this person could not folk, could not survive out there on their own without coming back to the emergency room. It's a, it's our... It's an equivalent safety net to prison. I mean, it's it's our only two safety nets we have in America are prison and and hospital and the emergency room. Um, but anyway, so at, from a nursing perspective and from a yeah a hospital perspective, they would say, okay, no, if we deem them that they can't either don't have capacity or don't have the ability to get the resources that they need, they're going to stay in the hospital. But at whose cost? You know, at, at what cost? And again, it's about five thousand dollars a day uh, out of pocket to pay for the hospital, whatever basic services they provide. Which is, you know, the hospital knows that this patient's not going to pay that. You know, no matter how many debt collectors, you know, ten years down the road. So anyway, so the hospital has an interest in getting the hem then out of there. Anyway, so there are built-in things in our society. Um, as far as next steps. So they do take time, but you can um, petition to have somebody um, receive a conservatorship. Um, so that would be a legally designated person or entity that makes decisions on their behalf, ideally from a non-biased standpoint. Um, but that talk. takes a court order. That takes a judge to do that. But it, it does happen, and and that's and, and that would be the road we would we go down. So let's stop on that for a second, okay? Um, you, you alluded to you know there being court process and whatever. Normally, it seems like it's a pretty exhaustive and and intensive process to pick someone to be in charge of your life when you're no longer capable of being in charge of it yourself, and. In these situations, what we're just willy nilly picking someone at the last minute so we can figure out what to do in this. Am I am I on to so, something here, or am I? <laughs> so maybe let's talk a little right. bit about how you become a conservator, and and then in the let's say in the best case scenario, becoming a conservator as opposed to this last minute we can't afford to keep this person in the hospital every day. Let's get somebody in here. You know, be conservative. Yeah. So. From the moment someone comes in the emergency room, we're always trying to find their next of kin, their emergency contact, who what, who needs to be updated. And with relation uh, relative to health decisions, you know, do we need to put this person on a ventilator? Do we do chest compressions? Do we save their lives? The person comes in from a motor vehicle accident, even if they're 25 and they can't speak for themselves, we try to reach the next of kin. And there is a legal uh, line of progression as far as who to contact. Um, you know, as far as someone who's 25 and not married, uh, it would not default to a live-in girlfriend or boyfriend. It would default to a parent um, or a legally aged child, right? And so you get into those situations where, no, we've been together for 20 years. I should make medical decisions for my boyfriend, but legally, you're not married. <laughs> so guess what? We have to find your next the blood kid. When, so when it comes to medical decisions, because they're so, I'm assuming because they're so um, timely, we can default to just a verbal over the phone. I'm her daughter. I say save her life. I will be there tomorrow. And we can talk more about that. But bigger than that with financial issues, signing, signing legal documents of who's going to get paid for what 
facilities, um, that is a legal responsibility. So that is when a court or a lawyer needs to get involved. If it's something that's been taken care of beforehand, right, before that 25-year-old got in the car accident or before the 75-year-old had a stroke, they had a legal document that said that designates someone as power of attorney. When they had their capacities, they signed it and said, if I am ever unable to provide for myself or make my own decisions, I designate so-and-so, whether it's a next of kin or a neighbor or a friend or a boyfriend, whatever. As long as that's been signed when they had capacity beforehand, that's legally binding. We love that. Thank you. Thank you for thinking ahead because it's, it's too late if you've yeah, lost your capacity. How, how many 25-year-olds are, are even – this is even on their radar. I mean I don't want to speak for everybody, my experience being relative to everyone. But when I was 25, I was fucking indestructible. <laughs> I mean I, I – I, th- the last thing I was thinking was there's going to be a point in my life where I'm not in control of my faculties and I need to pick someone to hell. No, I'm like, drive faster, do more pot and alcohol. Like I wasn't even thinking that way, you know? And- sure. And the, and the answers to these questions are pretty obvious when it is a 25 year old. Oh, they have the rest of their life to live. We need to save their life. We need to preserve their finances. We need to send them to a long-term rehab to get rehabilitation. Um, the unfortunate situation is that people who are 55, 65, 75, 85 still think that way. I'm indestructible. I don't need to set up anyone to take care of my finances. I don't need anyone, any second name on my bank accounts. I don't need da, 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 da. And it. Who are you to tell me I'm not in control? Of my Yeah, I could, I, I'm probably, I, I'm getting closer to that scenario where like, don't tell me I can't do it. I'm 179 years old. And I've been doing this since before the big one. And, yeah. And reluctant mm-hmm. to let someone be that person, because in a way that's saying, Hey, I have less control over things than I am comfortable admitting. Right. Yeah. And it it coincides a lot of behavioral issues with these long-term patients in the hospital. They've lost control. We're keeping them confined to a bed, a room, you know, they want to go home. They want, but they fall at home. They, their family, you know, they've had issue drama with their family and the family doesn't want to take care of them or they don't have the resources to. And anyway, I don't know what, uh, sure. Okay. So let me, let's turn the page onto what advice do I have or recommendations. And um, I think it's, you know, Back to the basics of everyone's going to die, including you. And I'm talking to everybody. Be prepared for it, right? Be prepared for these types of situations where you can't make your own decisions. And even if you feel like you have no, nothing to pass on or you need to, somebody, you need to have someone you trust that has access to your resources because you might be stuck in a hospital bed paralyzed one day. Um, And then bigger than that from a, societal perspective, even a government perspective, we need to do so much more to take care of elderly. Um, Medicare is not enough. Sure, we have sure we have Medicare, but it Medicare does not cover housing, it does not cover food, it does not cover, it gives you a little bit of, you know, it's a health insurance program. um, But it's not a pension type program that's set up to care for people who have lived a great life, contributed to society or not contributed to society, but either way deserve to have dignity in their last years. Um, You know, there's very few programs and they're usually run by states, individual states that have budgets for uh, long-term health insurance for these types of patients who have nowhere to go. What, what do you do with them? You know? So, so maybe you may or may not have the answer to this question, but do you know of any type of, resources for you know people on low incomes and the people the poverty line you know a lot of poor people in the country who may not who don't have a family doctor or whatever or maybe is there i'm thinking where i live in reno there's a hot clinic maybe that i don't even know would they be able to go and establish something i mean is there services available to people who are on the poor spectrum do you, do you even know because if, for, if, for, you're, if you're middle class or you're upper middle class and you have, you know, your family doctor, you have your family your lawyer, lawyer insurance, and you, can, you can just sit down with your family doctor and say, Hey, I want to talk about this stuff. And then you can work it out. But if you don't have any of that, you don't even have health insurance. Maybe you're working 
you know, uh, maybe you're an Uber driver and you work part time in a kitchen washing dishes somewhere and you don't have any goddamn insurance. Um, Unfortunately, are you aware of any type of service out there to help facilitate these people making these types of decisions? I mean, that's where state Medicaid comes in. Sure. Okay. So if you don't have health insurance and you roll into the emergency room, the hospital is going to say, well, we'll help you sign up for Medicaid so that we get paid. Right. And so we, so the hospital does proactively try to get people onto Medicaid as soon as we find out they don't have insurance. The unfortunate thing is Medicaid differs from county to county, let alone state to state. Um, it's, a uh, usually a 30 day application process, uh, before you can get onto, but that's just to be a card carrying insurance holder, really. It's really not super beneficial except for peace of mind to be able to hand over that card at registration that you have health insurance. But, um, it's, uh, I've seen many a case where, where patients with, less than ideal resources leave the hospital because they have to go back to work. They have, I don't care if I'm sick. I don't care. You know, I, I care that I'm sick. I care that my toe has gangrene, but if I don't drive the next five days on my Uber route, like I won't be able to pay my rent and then I'm going to have bigger problems, you know? And so uh, there are very few resources to cover people for their financial needs while they're in the hospital. Um, Right. Unless it's a defaulted family assumption, right? Oh, well, always, you know, I have an aunt or I have a son or I have a this or that, but very, um, unfortunately that's not, can't be assumed or can't be expected in every situation. Yeah, oh, I'll keep looking. Point. We keep advocating. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, but it's just, this is, I, I'm sure, you know, going to be a recurring theme through these segments in the upcoming shows but it's just another example of how i just our healthcare system is not about healing sick people at all at all like if mm-hmm. each sick person is a commodity they're a potential mm-hmm. dollar sign that's that's it and like even like the stuff that bernie was suggesting back in 2016 you know, eight fucking years ago where we almost had a conversation about health care mm-hmm. still wasn't even enough you know, mm-hmm. it still wasn't going to tackle all of these issues. Expanded Medicaid would have been better, but it wouldn't solve these issues. And, you know, I, I think another recurring thing you're going to hear on every episode coming forward is this, this is a massive failing of capitalism. We have allowed the profit incentive to completely take over every aspect of our lives. Like, until we have a capitalist, anti-capitalist revolution, until the masses rise up and say we're done with this economic system, these problems are going to persist, and we're going to. It's a value. Yeah. Go ahead. The value is on money. It's not on like I like to help us have a conversation about all of this. Like as a society, we need to say we value life and we value quality of life we value 80 year olds who still have the ability to you know own their own houses or whatever you know instead we talk about profit and money and and budgets and um and so i think again to redirect or to pull attention away from capitalism you've got to have different values (laughs) and what are they sure you know so as a society what are they And, and they're very usually empty promises when they are talked about in our day and age value values that aren't money related. Yeah. And they'll pull out the latest popular scapegoat, whether it's critical race theory or go look at the wokes or look, look at a trans person in sports. You know, there's out of you know, every thousand different, like, you know, high school level sports program out of for every thousand there's maybe one kid that's trans that wants to play and but it does a really good job of distracting the average person with that fear of that trans kid to not think about what's going to happen when i lose my fucking marbles and can't pay my health insurance and they fucking drop me off on the sidewalk in front of the hospital don't think about that Oh my gosh, there's, you know, they're going to teach slavery in high school. Mm -hmm. And and it it sounds so like ridiculous that uh, it's not that obvious. It's not that simple. It's that obvious and simple. 
in every situation, you know, the right wing media sphere. That's their whole entire job, whether it's Fox News or the Daily Wire or Blaze or that fucking dumbass motherfucker, Patrick Bet David. God, what a dumb. Um, I don't know about that. It's, I know. Well, he, he's a dude who made a bunch of money like in real estate or some shit or investment banking. And then because he made shit tons of money and then bought a building, like literally bought a building to do podcasts, bought a little bank and has all this money to throw around and get a lot of top level guests. And because he wrote a book, something like, you know, the next five fucking things you do. You know, every one of these jackasses writes the next five steps. And he wrote one of those dumbass books. And thinks he's a freaking political genius because he can regurgitate the things that Fox News and the Daily Wire say. But it's really important because I have lots of money. Anyway, that's Patrick Ed David. Okay. But their whole, you know, the whole fucking sphere is about whatever the specific topic is, divert it, squirrel, get you looking at something different. Because in the end, what we're talking about in ending capitalism is not allowing, I would say, maybe a few hundred thousand people, maybe a million people, make all the decisions that directly affect everyone else on the planet. And they think they're entitled to them. And they have a lot of money because they are the wealthiest, they are the capitalist ruling class after all. This entire global economy facilitates their ability to lock power. And they're going to do anything and everything they can to make sure that that never changes. And one of the things that facilitates and strengthens their ability to do that is to have poor people suffering without the mental capacity to take care of themselves on a fucking street corner under a bridge or something. Because if that person had their mental health issues actually properly addressed from the medical professional, they might overcome them. They might be functioning members of society. They might read some fucking Malatesta and realize, holy shit, this capitalism shit is fucked up. They almost stuck me out on the street. <laughs> we can't have people doing that. So we need them sick. We need them suffering. We need them worrying about where their next meal is coming from. What happens if my kid gets sick because I won't be able to pay rent next month? That's what they want us thinking. And that, that fear needs to be existential and real. And it their solution is to just work harder. Get a, sec get a fourth job. There can't, they, they don't want you thinking about any other solution like i don't know destroying the ruling class <laughs> like no the, no the, there is a solution to your problem make more money Thank you.